a reminder for everybody, there is a workshop on Arduino uh, right now, and you will, will have a talk on uh, NetBSD, and slowly we are approaching the streaming setup from hell. We just found another source for video and have a nice pre presenter here for the embedded devices, we will see. And please, Pierre, go on. Thank you. So I'm Pierre Poncher, and I, thanks for joining in. Thanks for coming to the conference. Um, I will tell you a bit about what I did for the better part of this year, which is putting NetBSD on a tablet system. Um, so I'm freelance, actually. I'm a consultant, focusing on security, but I'm also, yeah, I enjoy OS development, and I happen to become a NetBSD developer during this project, so this is really cool. And um, I'm based in Berlin. So I'm going to introduce uh, the D4iOS project, something I've been working on for about 10 years now, and which is really re relevant to what I'm doing here right now. Uh, of course, NetBSD, because it's not the most popular system around, but I think it deserves a few slides. Then I'm going to go back in time a bit and explain how I have uh, come to work on all of this. Speak about the contest, which brought all of the tablet uh, stuff, which brought me to, to work on this. And if we have enough time, of course, I will uh, show off a bit and let you see how it goes. So, Defora. It's an open source project, of course, because I'm really into open source. That's what's brought me here. That's how I learned all of this, and I want to give back as much as I can. But still, um, I am very frustrated very re regularly about the state of software in general, not only open source. And when it comes to just um, synchronizing IRC chat logs between computers, uh, it just doesn't work. You, you, even if you use an IRC proxy, you were going to have uh, your logs on one side and the others on another, another side, and you don't know which ones you have read or not. And when you want to follow open source projects with IRC channels for development, it's really annoying when you switch between machines to like reread everything again. So, of course, this is not only about IRC. I want to apply this to RSS, to bookmarks, to everything I do, basically. I want to have just one computer system, even if it's my phone for a minute or a tablet for another and so on. So that's the aim of the project. I'm trying to fix this. So the keywords here are ubiquitous computing, seamless networking, and so on. And of course, today it makes even more sense since we have all the time our smartphones with us, and now everybody has a tablet. I don't know what they do much with it, but yeah, and of course, laptops and so on. So the project itself is made of three parts. Uh, of course, I cannot write a complete system at once, so I'm cutting this into different sub-projects and implementing each and every one uh, in sequence, but really under three different umbrellas. So one is like the paradise of operating system development. It's the self-hosted thing where, where you are able to generate your own system using the system. So for this, you need a kernel, a libc, an assembler, a compiler, and so on. So I've been working on this, of course. Then I am working on a distributed framework where uh, this is where the uh, thing about IRC chat logs synchronizing between computers comes into play because you need message passing to synchronize all of this. And so there is a part completely, completely dedicated to this functionality. And then, of course, I need feedback. I need visuals. I need user interface. And that's the third part. I think it's a very important one, too, to focus on. And so I'm working not only on desktop systems, but also targeting embedded devices now. And as I said, I cannot uh, implement everything at once. So before it gets a complete whole, I'm working on existing operating systems. And I'm, I don't care about which one it is. I'm also working on Windows, on Mac OS X, on different BSDs, on Linux, and so on. So almost everything from here works on any current platform. I mean, I'm trying to write portable code, and usually it just compiles. So um, back in the days, I started with the kernel, because it was like the most exciting part to many, it is the most exciting part to many OS hobbyists. But it's very difficult, because yeah, great, you follow your tutorial, and you have some processes and so on, but then what to do? I mean, it's very difficult to know already what you want to have, how it should look like, and how to implement it. So I chose another approach, and I decided to learn some more about all of this, because I was still studying at the time. And I basically rewrote a POSIX environment. Not a complete one, but enough to understand how everything works. 
So I have a libc, I have some Unix utilities and so on. I'm trying to put a graphical interface on top of that and then I'm working on the more innovating parts. So the system, as I said, works on existing platforms, uh, the ones that are the most common, at least. It's implemented step by step, of course, because it's only me so far and a couple of contributors sometimes. And um, so the aim is to make everything uh, connect together and fit. So NetBSD, we have a new release, which is going to be announced maybe in the next two days. It's 6.01. So this slide was made when 6.0 was released, but um, I'm really glad to say that I could put my own contributions to this system, and it's, it's like the best release we've done so far uh, from the foundation. So yeah, it's pretty cool. The story about my, how I came to NetBSD is also kind of funny, because as I said, I was studying computer science, and I was in a French school in Paris, and we had an assignment which was namely to install three different operating systems on three different machines, because this was a sysadmin exercise. And we had to share um, authentication, we had to share home directories and so on. And as part of the assignment, one of the system was enforced to be NetBSD2, because it was considered to be cumbersome, difficult, but actually it's just because it's very clean. It's because it's not full bloated with overlapping commands and so on. You just have one command for everything, and they're not necessarily like the ones you have on Linux, even less on Windows. So actually, I really liked it, and that's how I came to use it every day since version three. So if I have to uh, emphasize on some aspects, uh, I would say clean, portable, embedded, coherent, and very fun to hack on. So while I was... Uh, talking about NetBSD in different places, I realized some people have really misconceptions about the system. You do not have to compile each and every parts of it when you install it. You don't have to compile anything at all. We have binary packages, we have binary sets, we support many, many different uh, um, platforms, and we do not necessarily want to support all of them. It's just because the system was cleanly designed in the first place that it becomes easy to port on different platforms, but it was never the goal to cover all of this stuff. So one reason for the um, ease of portability in the system is that cross-compilation is free. What I mean is that the system is always cross-compiled. Even if you work for 64-bit Intel on a 64-bit Intel machine and you want to build NetBSD, it's always first going to build a toolchain targeting NetBSD 64 bits which means with the same set of make files, the same scripts, the same system, you can target any BSD architecture, even if you're working on Linux or on Mac or whichever system you have. You don't even need to have a virtual machine running NetBSD on whichever system to compile something for ARM for one of these devices. It's just always the case. It's always cross-compiling. And it's just one command to generate a toolchain for any architecture, and that's really, really cool. And so, therefore, I'm using it as the reference system for the 4 OS. So, NetBSD on tablets in particular, uh, it's not something new. Um, I don't know if you know this device here, the Sharp Zorus. It's a PDA, which was released back in uh, early 2000. And there were different models. Um, it was originally re uh, running Linux, but some people ported uh, BSD on it. And I have an installation of OpenBSD on it here. I should switch it up first to show how it boots. So bear with me for a second. That should, that should do. And yes, so it, it's a PDA like this. Can you see it? It is a tablet because the screen can actually turn, rotate this way, and then it's just a device like this. And you have a stylus, yeah. You have a stylus, it's a resistive touchscreen, and you can interact with the device this way. So that's pretty awesome, and I can start it while I keep talking. So it takes a while to boot, don't be surprised. Uh, you can. Let it talk nicely with the camera. 
the screen also rotates so you can uh, bend it if it's nicer and so on. All right, so NetBSD is working on this device, but first it was OpenBSD that was ported on it and it's, it's the one that's installed right now. And therefore we do have a touchscreen uh, framework inside the kernel called Typicalib, but um, we, do not, we did not have, have uh, last year, uh, until last year, uh, a modern touchscreen driver. So the framework was only used by such uh, PDA devices. So that's what I had to work on, mostly for this project. So if I go back in time to explain how I came to work on all of this. Um, back in 2008, I've been working uh, for a while with Berstec. It's a French company. It's a hosting company, but they also have some R&D department, and I was part of this. And uh, one of these projects was to sell open hardware. So we are trying to promote open source hardware. And we opened a shop called Hackable Devices, which is still running today. And uh, we were focusing on the OpenMoco Freerunner initially. It's an open source phone. Um, it's also here. You can show it a bit later if you want. So this uh, phone was released in 2008. And even though the hardware was open source, there wasn't really a distribution that, really, that we really liked, that was complete, that could allow people to phone comfortably and so on. So we decided to create one based on Debian. And um, as part of this work, I ended up porting my existing desktop on uh, this, this device. And that's how I came to target uh, other embedded platforms. Eventually, the Nokia N100 and also an HTC Touch Pro. I have both of them here. I can show them boot a bit later. So this is how it looked like uh, for the D4OS desktop at the time. This is a very early screenshot. Uh, so there is a menu at the bottom left where you can launch applications. It displays the current provider on the uh, top left with the time of the day. There is a dialer and so on. Um, I hope you can see it well enough on, on the slides. Um, a bit later, I switched to a white or grayish background, so maybe it's easier to read it this way also now. So I supported uh, network connections, of course. Uh, it was only a 2G device, but it was still pretty useful to browse the web, with, even with a slow, slow bandwidth. And I wrote a, a home screen after a while. So these icons at the middle of the screen can be clicked, and then it shows different menus and lets you access applications and so on. So that's how it looks like on, on this screen, which is uh, 480 by 640 pixels. And this is how uh, I heard about the Afil Top contest after that through Berstech. So Afil is a French open source user group which launched the contest back in 2011. It was about creating a 100% open source tablet within six months because we have a lot of different open source desktop environments, but none of them is really targeting finger-based interaction or um, this kind of uh, newer concepts for user interfaces. So they were trying to motivate people to, to work on this. Uh, the hardware didn't have to be open source, thankfully, because there aren't so many tablets which are open source around here. However, we had some guidelines. It has it had to have a 10-inch touchscreen, good battery life, Wi-Fi support, of course, and so on. So I ended up choosing the WeTap tablet, which was originally shipped by a German company based on the MIGO operating system, which is now sort of abandoned. It was a joint venture by Nokia and Intel, a mix between Memo and um, what Intel had, Moblin, called MIGO after that. And it shipped on one phone, the Nokia N9, which I also have here, uh, which is the only Nokia phone to ship with Linux, I think. And so I just removed the system and installed my stuff instead. And I wanted to use NetBSD because I was really into it already at the time, actually for a while already. However, I did not have the tablet hardware with me yet, so I worked first with an ID pad, which is a netbook, which, we, which is a bit like the Zorus 2. You can flip the screen and it becomes a tablet. So this was really nice for development to have a full keyboard, a regular laptop hardware, and um, to work on it this way. So I had the first presentation at first time, uh, which was really early work in progress. 
So back then, I had uh, written the touchscreen driver already, which is just a USB HID device. I'm going to bring a couple more details about this. However, many things were missing. I required some patches. Uh, screen resolution wasn't native. I had no Wi-Fi support at the time. And more importantly, it was still not a complete tablet. It, was, it still had a keyboard. It was more like a laptop form factor. Um, and the interface looked like this. It was very stretched because of the resolution. And you can see still this menu on the bottom left. Uh, actually, everything is configurable. It's, it's just plugins, and you can move them around and disable, enable them, and so on. So it says unavailable at the top left because I didn't support the SIM card uh, inside the device. Uh, then you have the sys tray on the top right. Uh, it's a GTK based. So the look and feel is really the same as GTK, which is not always finger friendly, but there are ways to work on this. And so you can switch between applications and so on. So after that, I received the WeTab hardware. So a few words about it now. It's actually x86 based. So it's really a lot like a regular PC. Uh, it has uh, a BIOS. Here it's more like a firmware, but you can find equivalent hardware around which have uh, a BIOS instead, because I think it's just a generic Chinese um, device that was rebranded. So it features a Wi-Fi chip, a 3G chip, it has Bluetooth, 32 gigs of internal flash. There is another model which has no 3G and smaller storage. It has a camera uh, here on, on the front, and so on. And two USB ports, also very useful, HDMI output, uh, SD card, it's really a really nice device. Uh, it's a bit heavy, but it's also sometimes uh, helpful in some situations. You can really feel it. I will put it in a sh little while. And so uh, I'm glad to say that I co-won the contest with another guy who uh, wrote uh, an Android solution, Android-based solution. I have released documentation on, on the net. Unfortunately, the link is broken here, but you can just go into the uh, publication section of my professional website, and you will find a big PDF document with everything I did, the whole process and everything. And also, I was invited to become a NetBSD developer in the process after submitting a couple of contributions. And my first commit was breaking the USB keyboard driver. <laughs> But it didn't last long in the tree, I realized. Yeah, that's how you learn. Um, so I presented uh, the tablet again in France around the time that the contest was over. And so it was looking a lot nicer. Here it's not obvious, but the resolution was native. I was supporting the camera, Wi-Fi, not 3G yet. And so this is just a screenshot with the, from the camera on the NetBSD, NetBSD booth, sorry. Um, and so now, for more about what it all looks like. So as a reminder, it's running NetBSD uh, for the kernel and the base system. Because in NetBSD, it's not like in Debian or most Linux distributions where, you, where everything is packaged. You have a big coherent base with all of the essential manual pages, daemons, um, applications, and so on. And then on top of that, you put packages. So we have really two separate parts. And when there is an issue with the packaging management, whatever, you just erase the database, and you can just start from scratch. You don't have to reinstall anything. Um, so these packages come from the official. Uh, the packages are installed here come from the official, official uh, packages tree in NetBSD, which is called package source, PKGSRC. And of course, I installed D4RS on it, which I have packaged as part of this. And um, the aim is, as, as I said, to interact nicely with your hands, look appealing. And here is how I'm trying to achieve this. So today looks a bit more like this. So I have 3G support now on the tablet. I can send messages and so on. OK, it doesn't always work, I, reckon, I, I admit. But that's how it looks like. I have a virtual keyboard, a bunch of applications, and so on. So now let's, let's boot it, because that's the only proof I have that it really works anyway. So it's really a NetBSD device. As you can see, the firmware was already loaded, and this is the regular NetBSD bootloader on x86. 
So I let it uh, wait for five seconds, but otherwise it boots in about 45. Um, so um, it's now loading the kernel. It's um, like the, the, there is a cursor uh, spinning right now. And it should display the splash screen in a second. Yes. So you, of course you can change, change that. You can put any picture you want. And uh, a few configuration bits here. On NetBSD, the, the, we have a configuration file for the bootloader, of course. And if you want to put a uh, splash screen on your device, you just put these configuration settings here. So what, what I put in bold characters here. And you also specify minus D so that the kernel doesn't say anything anymore. And then everything is fine. So here I'm going to put my SIM code, and it doesn't matter if I show it to you, I can change it afterwards anyway. Uh, OK, too small. <laughs> yeah, it works, it works. And it's valid. I know my SIM code. So anyway, um, 45 seconds to boot, which is pretty neat, I think. Um, so I used GDM to automatically log in to the system. This can be configured graphically with a mouse or whatever uh, fingers, usually not when you install it, but because you have to calibrate and everything, but I will come to this. And otherwise, you can also use the configuration file, of course, and put these couple of settings, and it will log you in nicely directly when you boot. So calibration. Um, I had to patch the kernel, as I said, and some user applications to make it work. But this is how um, it now works, because I committed this last week. So we have a common framework for every input device in NetBSD, keyboard, mice, and so on. And it's uh, here, minus M is to talk to it as a mouse. A is displaying every property. And this is the, second, uh, the third mouse detected on the system. And it's a touch panel device. Um, first, it tells to which resolution it should um, bind itself to. Then you input a bunch of samples to calibrate it. And that's basically it. So it's enough to calibrate the screen. And there is also a way to do it graphically, which I just discovered, because it was only available on, on smaller devices like this, which is called uh, TPCTL. And it's the regular five points um, interface. And then it puts this automatically into the system. So this is pretty user friendly as well. So as I said, um, the touchscreen itself is connected to the USB bus. So it's just a regular HID device. And it's reporting sometimes multiple mice because it's meant to be used with Windows. You're meant to be able to install Windows without a keyboard on such hardware. How this is done is that you have some fake uh, mouse, uh, mice on USB. One of them has relative coordinates and is automatically calibrated for a uh, default resolution of 1024, 768. And the other one is the one you want to use uh, because it brings you absolute coordinates and therefore you can calibrate it for different resolutions and so on. And you have to switch the device in a specific mode to be able to use the absolute uh, coordinates. And it's done using an HID command, which in NetBSD is, is performed this way. So we have the list of properties, and we just uh, browse into it like a syscontrol up to a device mode. And if you put mode 2, it's going to bring you interrupt only on the absolute coordinates device, which is something really necessary. OK, so this brings us to X, X11. Um, so in NetBSD, we have patched the input mouse uh, driver to support our framework, WSCONS. And therefore, I had to patch it to support absolute coordinates. It's now done and available inside the tree. Uh, it needs more work, because if I rotate the screen here, the coordinates are going to be wrong. So I have to fix this still. But otherwise, it works um, yeah, quite, quite well. I can show it also here on screen. I can use the menu here and launch some application, like uh, the camera maybe, which is going to maybe do a nice feedback. It's the video. Sorry, guys. So yeah, that's, that's about X11. Uh, focusing on GTK now, um, I'm enforcing the DPI, because there are some sometimes misbehaviors when you rotate the screen and so on, or wrong detection and so on. So you can force it this way if you want. Um, 
other than specifying the resolution in XORG, which is now no longer necessary. Um, so GTK, you can enforce bigger um, controls easily by just forcing the, the, the icons to be, uh, to be larger, sorry. So if I go into the menu here, please. Maybe the camera is taking 100% CPU because it's just pulling right now. So yeah, by making the icons bigger and the fonts a bit larger, I have something which is very usable with just the, the finger, which is pretty cool. Of course, Xterm, Xterm is not gonna be so finger friendly, but I have written a virtual keyboard, which should pop up now. Yeah, so here it is, and you can input commands, and of course, the obligatory you name. So yes, it runs NetBSD on WeTab, and so on. Uh, you can even emulate the uh, third click, which is very useful in a lot of applications, by using a special GTK module, which is called GTK Stylus, so I have also enabled it here. Um, so now about the desktop itself, the user applications, I have showed you a couple already, like the keyboard, the panel is, is here. Um, then I have a lock screen. I'm gonna show it in the next slide. Um, wrong button, please. Yeah. Hello, computer. Yeah. So uh, they are um, XTG compliant. So here I have a mix of BSD packages and of the D4RS desktop installed. But I have a PDF viewer, the camera interface, you can see it here, a media player, um, text editor, all of the essential stuff is basically there. Of course, when I can, I reuse libraries like Poplar for PDF or WebKit and so on. But other than that, I really wanted to have a coherent whole also for the desktop applications. So I'm trying to cover as much as possible, even with fewer features, but I really appreciate to have such a system. So if you want to target uh, embedded devices from these packages and you're using package source, you can specify this option and it will uh, use the same code as the regular desktop applications, but compile them without menu bars and so on to be more friendly with the screen surface here. And so if you want to start the desktop on your system, you can also use this xclients file. And from GDM, it's gonna nicely display, launch the system. I do not have my window manager yet, so I'm using Matchbox here. Uh, which is also why I have some features disabled because Max Matchbox is a bit buggy with some uh, shaped windows. But other than that, it's also a nice solution for, embedded, for an embedded window manager. So the screensaver, I uh, had a bit of fun designing this. So uh, I have a scrolling screen with compositing and so on um, for the screensaver itself. So yeah, it's, uh, hello, come back. Yeah, so after a timeout, it should display the same screen. No, not now, okay, I don't know why it doesn't want to, but I have a slider to unlock it. So much like on a numbered device, when I lock the screen, I can just um, come back to the desktop by uh, sliding this little knob, and it will nicely bring you back to the desktop. Um, a bit more about NetBSD now, we have a framework for power management where pretty much every message from the system which is really, uh, relevant to power management is centralized. And as part of this, I have um, implemented a way to integrate the desktop with the um, power management events. So if you just put a couple of scripts over there, the desktop, uh, the, the panel is gonna notify you when you plug and plug uh, your AC charger or when the battery goes down or, and so on. So here, here is a, a screenshot to illustrate it. Um, as I said, 3G uh, based network connections are implemented and are working with a graphical interface. So this is uh, how it looks like on screen. You just put the APN, username, passport, and it basically works. The way I did it is a bit special because I already, I already have 
a, a process listening to the GSM modem to uh, get incoming calls and so on. And I do not want to pass the device over to chat like it's usually done in open source world to set up dial-up connections. So this daemon which I wrote is talking to the modem and sending all of the PPP data automatically to the PPPD daemon. And to perform this, there is a special mode called um, PTY mode, which you enable using the no TTY um, parameter. And other than that, you just call PPPD, which is performed by the user interface also. And it's going to set up the system nicely, change the route, and so on. And you can connect to the network. That's pretty neat. Of course, Wi-Fi also works. Um, it's using DHCP CD right now. I can maybe illustrate it here on screen. So there is a small uh, application running inside the sys here. And it's displaying the different Wi-Fi networks available. And you can just pick one and it should connect to it. Uh, I'm not sure it's gonna work right now because there is a special system here with passwords and so on, but usually it works. Um, so these are additional configuration parameters you need to uh, input if you want to use this. It integrates nicely with WPA supplicant for uh, WPA networks and so on, asking the passphrases. So it's pretty neat. Um, there is a GPS device inside the tablet Right now, it doesn't fully work because of two reasons, mainly. There is a minor bug, minor bug with the uh, modem driver, which is also found on Linux, by the way, where sometimes when you open, uh, actually, it's the 3G modem, which brings you also a GPS interface. And when you open one, sometimes it blocks the other. It's a bit strange. But uh, I have written a small plugin to try to debug this. So inside the preferences uh, for, the, for the telephony applications, which are here, there is a way, I mean, I have different plugins. You can enable, disable different ones. So here I have enabled the GPS one. And it's a very simple one, which just tells the modem to start or stop listening on, on this device, on the GPS device. And so after that, uh, you run GPSD and you launch some user interface for it. However, right now, the code is a bit buggy on BSD and it crashes. So I guess there is some bug there that doesn't trigger on Linux. And so there is some more, more work to, to do to have the GPS, uh, full GPS support. But other than that, pretty much everything is supported. So touchscreen, 3G, video camera, Wi-Fi, uh, video resolution, um, and as I mentioned, we could improve a bit the situation with power management and GPS, but it's really pretty cool already to have this, I think. I mean, I just, I like it. So which are my plans for the future now? Uh, I think I'm gonna insert a picture of the skate overboard here. Yeah. But other than that, I'm uh, working on the Nokia N900 uh, phone, which is this device here. Some of you may know about it because it was running Linux. Well, it's, it's actually the first Linux-based phone th that Nokia released because it has uh, a 3G modem, but it was not sold as a phone. It was sold as a tablet device. It has a sliding keyboard. It's not exactly like this one, like the Zorus, but it's also very useful for debugging, of course. So it looks like this, and I have NetBSD running on it, as far as support is available right now. So this is U-Boot with the Linux logo. Maybe I should turn it around. Yeah. And so yes, it's putting NetBSD right now. It doesn't go very far because I, we have userland support, but I'm focusing on, it's gonna slide, I'm focusing on uh, kernel drivers right now. So this is basically part of my latest tests, trying to support the I2C bus on OMAP because we still do not have a driver for it in BSD. But we are working on this. Um, and so this is, uh, this would be the first proper phone we could support uh, with NetBSD. I'm sure some other devices would also be possible to support, but this one is very user-friendly to, to debug, to work on. I really like the hardware, and there is all of the Linux code already available, so that really helps. So this is pretty neat, unlike most Android-based devices. 
Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we have NetBSD running on D900. Um, I committed the configuration file upstream for the kernel. We have the installer running, but we have no keyboard driver right now, so it's useless. Um, there is a file system in BSD now for flash-based storage. We have some NAND drivers, maybe not the one here, I don't know yet. We are working on I2C and some other uh, drivers. Um, I2C is basically the one we really need first because there is a, a chip next to the OMAP that's talking the I2C bus on which almost everything is connected. So we really need it uh, to have keyboard, audio, and so on. And yeah, so that's basically for NetBSD side of it. And about D4OS now, I had some um, requests a while ago to switch to from CVS, which I was using all this time, to Git. And so I did. So now the project is hosted on GitHub. And I have there about 41 sub-projects. Unfortunately, during the migration, I had to break many things because I had tightly integrated everything with CVS, including daily builds, including the mailing lists, um, the meta project gathering all of the other projects, which no longer exist right now, which is a bit annoying to jump into the system because it's really necessary to generate make files and so on. And also I had integration with my website for the repository and so on, and right now it's only the old code you will find there. So I have to fix that too. Unfortunately, but other than that, um, basically I'm also thinking about switching to GDK3. It's more or less ready, except for some X extensions I was using, which are not supported. Um, and of course, um, if you have any idea, feel free to contact me. I'm always interested in hearing more about how the interface should look like, how to interface with uh, stylus, fingers, and so on, all in one neat package at best. And, and voila. I mean, this is how, this is where you can find default OS, NetBSD, my professional site, and myself on Twitter and my own page. Um, if we have more time, I can demo a bit more. What's the status? About 50 minutes. Okay, cool. So I hope I wasn't too fast. If any one of you wants me to go back on in time and have a closer look at any specific part, uh, of course I can. And other than that, uh, we can have fun booting Linux or BSD on different devices here. So this one is done. We run NetBSD on it. This one was running OpenBSD. It was even running X. I think it should still be booted. Yeah, so this is the XTM grid screen with the OpenBSD logo. So before we demo, any further, are there uh, questions? So they don't get dropped? Yeah? Yes. What did you do to reduce boot time? Not much, actually, because BSD boots really, really fast. Not Just using uh, sread head or anything like that? I'm using what, sorry? Um, uh, sread head. S uh, to load everything from... Um, the drive in one pull. Uh, You're not doing anything special, essentially. You're just letting is this Linux specific do something. Or is this specific to Linux? Or? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. It was written for the Moblin project originally. Yeah, so it's certainly but specific to Linux. So it doesn't apply here. And it's faster not only because it's PSD, of course. It's, not, it's also because we have fewer developers. And so not every driver does everything maybe the Linux drivers do. And we don't have maybe as many delays because sometimes uh, we never tested stuff on hardware that's broken and, and it didn't happen to us to have such issues. So it's, uh, hardware support is usually a pain in somewhere and um, yeah, so it's, it's really difficult to, to, to tell how fast it boots uh, because it can always change depending on, on what you, you try to, to look at and everything. Um, however, the BSD system is a bit smaller than Linux because the libc is smaller, the base applications are smaller and so on because they're not overbloated with GNU stuff. <coughs> Sorry, it's just my opinion. But, and um, so as a result, everything boots pretty fast. Yeah. 
Um, so here I have a Windows phone, which was um, modified to support Android, and I used this to boot my own system instead. So it's going to boot Linux, but with the 4 OS on top. So I can leave this in the background while we reply to the next question. Um, yeah, this way. So it's putting, it's putting Linux now. It's gonna take a while. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. Okay. So next question. Uh, one more question. Oh, maybe two of them. The one is rather simple. What software was used to enter the SIM code? So I wrote this myself. It's part of the D4R desktop. It's called Phone. So D4R is Phone. Um, it was developed from scratch? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so some sort of a script? No? It's this one here. It's written in C. Uh -huh. The GTK, it yeah, has a plugin um, system for talking to the, to the modem. So I'm also supporting the beginning of VoIP through the Sophia SIP library. Um, and uh, other than that, I can maybe show a bit more of it um, over here. So, yeah. So it doesn't have a proper um, window per se by default, but it goes into the sysstray if you want to, because uh, it has, therefore, as I said, it has a plugin system for uh, GPS support, other in hardware integration and so on. Even has some security features. Um, I support different um, audio um, protocols, I mean, uh, APIs to play sounds, ringtones and so on. Um, this was started with the um, GSM modem, but I can start a terminal here. If it wants to, yeah. Okay. And so if I launch with the Sophia, I think. It's gonna, yeah, it's replacing the existing operator uh, display with another instance of the phone uh, application. And you're gonna have here instead um, your C preferences and so on. So yeah, I wrote this myself and it supports uh, different, uh, this framework. Does this answer your question? Uh, yeah, I have, um one more, and maybe even two more uh, questions. <laughs> I just got one more idea. Uh, the first was um, about um, your, uh, your um, target um, your dream of six hours of battery life. Yeah. As far as I know, this tablet uh, was uh, or still is examined by a Russian Alt Linux company uh, as a development platform for their patches for the third GNOME, GNOME shell, uh, which I think is not available in BSD world, and maybe it's good. We have GNOME 3 in BSD. Uh, so uh, they have three, four hours of battery life. It has about three hours of battery life, this one, yes. Uh -huh. the so the situation is the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the other question. Uh, how did you choose the desktop environment? I wrote it myself, so it was an easy uh, task. Why? Because I don't like GNOME, I don't like KDE, I don't like XFCE, I don't like LXDE. And when I started, not all of them existed, because I started in 2004. And uh, I didn't intend to do embedded development at the time directly, but I was not satisfied with the existing stuff. Especially at the time we had the early Nautilus application for GNOME, and it was just a complete mess. And so I wrote my own file browser, and I still use it today. I mean, and it's really light and flexible. And since I have so much now control over my own applications, it's much easier for me to implement something fast and to extend it. And I can even show you an example here. 
like this is my file manager, and I wrote a plugin system with a different ones, uh, different set of uh, plugins implemented. And so if I just go into the uh, NetBSD source tree, which is down here, here, uh, source. So I have, it should, oh, no, wait, I'm not in source. It's a bit strange with scrolling here. Is it maximized? Yeah. Anyway, okay. What's going on? Demo effect, huh? Well, okay, I'm just in, gonna input it here. Okay, so it's integrated now with CVS, and so I have a CVS client just by writing a few lines of code as a plugin in my file manager. And so therefore, when I hit a file or a, a directory uh, be belonging to the CVS tree, I detect the revision, I can request diffs, I can commit directly from here. So I don't need to write a CVS program. Just because I master the code of the browser, I can easily integrate and have my uh, whatever functionality I need. And it works also with cheat, with SVN. I can also track the different volumes mounted and mount them. Um, I have the directory tree here and so on. And I can go back to Altroot or bin or whatever and so on. So this is the reason why I'm doing all of this myself. Well, I have just told that we have not much time to discuss it. Maybe I'll ask you myself the details. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, we have now like uh, nine minutes until the next talk. We need some time for the technical setup. Is there any more question for the audience? Then, okay. Thank you very much for your you. uh, insight into a NetBSD. Watch out for demons. Um, and we are now entering um, a part of the conference that is more on integrated circuits, reverse engineering, and microprocessor design. Um, and we'll start with uh, reverse engineering in a couple of minutes at three. <laughs>